Hi everyone, this lesson is on thyroid cancer. In this lesson, we're gonna talk about the types of thyroid cancer, some of the pathophysiology behind why thyroid cancer occurs. We're also gonna talk about the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed and staged, and how it's treated. So thyroid cancer is a cancer of the thyroid gland, and the thyroid gland is an endocrine gland located in the anterior of the neck or the front of the neck. So the thyroid gland is responsible for making thyroid hormone like T3 or triiodothyronine and T4 or thyroxine, both of these hormones are responsible for movement, mentation, and metabolism. Now there are four main types of thyroid cancer or thyroid carcinoma, and these are papillary, follicular, medullary thyroid carcinoma, or MTC, and anaplastic. We're gonna talk about these four main types in more detail as we go through the next upcoming slides. And although there are four main types of thyroid cancer, there are actually two other less common types one being primary thyroid lymphoma, and the other one being primary thyroid sarcoma. Now, thyroid cancers account for approximately 1% of all cancers, and there is a higher incidence of thyroid cancer in females versus males. Females outnumber males 3 to 1 with thyroid cancer, and certain types of thyroid cancer have different ages of onset, but on average, the incidence of thyroid cancer peaks in the third and fourth decades of life. Let's get into more specific details on those four types of thyroid cancer we talked about before. So again, the first one is papillary carcinoma. So this is actually going to be the most common type of thyroid cancer. And papillary carcinoma accounts for 80% of all cases. So again, this is the most common type of thyroid cancer. The second is follicular carcinoma. So follicular carcinoma accounts for approximately 10% of all cases of thyroid cancer. And it has a particular subtype we're going to mention here known as the Hertel cell carcinoma subtype. So this Hertel cell or Hertel cell carcinoma accounts for approximately 2 to 3 percent of all cases of thyroid cancer. And this particular subtype occurs most commonly in women in their 50s. The third type of thyroid cancer is medullary thyroid carcinoma or MTC. This type accounts for approximately 5 to 10 percent of all cases. And it is part of the MEN2A and MEN2B conditions. So MEN stands for multiple endocrine neoplasia. So multiple endocrine neoplasia, MEN2A, MEN2B conditions. MEN2A and MEN2B are genetic conditions that increase the risk of other endocrine disorders, including pheochromocytoma and hyperparathyroidism. We're going to talk a bit more about this when we talk about risk factors for having thyroid cancer. And the fourth main type of thyroid cancer is anaplastic carcinoma. So anaplastic carcinoma accounts for 1% to 2% of all cases, and it occurs in older patients, so patients in the 6th to 7th decade of life, so 60s and 70s. That is going to be the age group where we start to see anaplastic carcinoma occurring. Now getting into more specific pathophysiology behind each of those four main types, there are two main cells that are responsible for these particular types of cancer. So we have follicular cells and C cells. So follicular cells are responsible for papillary carcinoma, follicular carcinoma, and anaplastic carcinoma, whereas cancers of C cells are responsible for medullary thyroid carcinoma. So again, a cancer of follicular cells is responsible for papillary carcinoma, follicular carcinoma, and anaplastic carcinoma, and a cancer of C-cells is responsible for medullary thyroid carcinoma. So if we were to look into each cancer in more detail, there are particular mutations that are more common with each type of cancer. For instance, in papillary carcinoma, a BRAF V600E mutation is going to be the most common type of mutation that can cause a papillary carcinoma or increase the risk of having papillary carcinoma. And then Another important mutation can be a RET papillary thyroid cancer or RET PTC translocation. Follicular carcinoma, some of the more important mutations that can occur or increase the risk of having follicular carcinoma include RAS mutations and PAX8 and PPAR gamma translocations. In anaplastic carcinoma, we can see P53 mutations occurring and RAS mutations occurring. So P53 mutations are going to be the most common mutation found in patients with anaplastic carcinoma. And then in medullary thyroid carcinoma, it's going to be the RET mutations. RET mutations are going to be responsible for MEN2A and MEN2B or those multiple endocrine neoplasia conditions that we talked about before.
So now that we know the four main types of thyroid cancer and some of the mutations that are responsible or that are found in those particular types of cancer, let's talk about the risk factors for getting thyroid cancer. So one of the biggest risk factors for getting thyroid cancer is going to be radiation exposure. So radiation exposure is going to increase risk of all thyroid cancers, especially papillary carcinoma. So this is going to be head and neck radiation exposure or could be exposure to radiation in the environment. So again, radiation exposure in particular parts of the world where there have been nuclear meltdowns, for instance, in those areas or surrounding areas, patients are at an increased risk for thyroid cancer. And then the other important point to note about radiation exposure is if a patient had radiation therapy for a previous cancer, especially if they had radiation therapy when they were younger. So patients who may have had lymphoma when they were younger and then they had radiation therapy, this also increases the risk of having thyroid cancer, again, especially papillary carcinoma. The second risk factor is a family history. So family history doesn't account for a large number of cases of thyroid cancer, but it does account for a smaller percentage of certain cancers like papillary carcinoma and medullary thyroid carcinoma when it comes to that genetic condition we talked about before, MEN2A and MEN2B. And this leads us into the third risk factor being genetic conditions. And again, genetic conditions like MEN2A and MEN2B. So we can see in this chart here, MEN2A has three important endocrine disorders that are associated with each other. So medullary thyroid carcinoma is one of them, but the other ones are pheochromocytoma and parathyroid hyperplasia leading to hyperparathyroidism. And then in MEN2B, we can see again, this medullary thyroid carcinoma, and then we can also see pheochromocytoma, mucosal neuromas, and marfanoid body habitus. So if a patient has a family history of some of these other endocrine conditions, they're at an increased risk of medullary thyroid carcinoma. And if they have medullary thyroid carcinoma, they may have some of these other conditions that have not been detected yet. So something to think about as well. Being female is also another risk factor for having thyroid cancer. As we mentioned before, females outnumber males three to one with thyroid cancers. Patient's age is also another potential risk factor. We talked about incidence increasing in the third to fourth decade of life, but some other types of cancer like anaplastic carcinoma occur at higher levels as a patient gets older in their 60s to 70s, for instance. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of thyroid cancer. So by far the most important sign that's going to occur in thyroid cancer is a thyroid nodule. So a thyroid nodule is going to be a little growth off of the thyroid gland. Again, the thyroid gland is in the front of the neck, so patients may actually feel or see this little lump protruding from their neck. So this is going to be a potential sign of thyroid cancer. However, there are a lot of patients that have thyroid nodules that actually don't have thyroid cancer. So thyroid nodules are actually not that uncommon. So this is a potential sign of thyroid cancer, but in most cases, a patient will not have thyroid cancer if they do have a thyroid nodule. There are particular characteristics of the thyroid nodule that's going to be important in thyroid cancer. The thyroid nodule itself is going to be painless. So if a patient were actually touch that lump on their neck in the area of the thyroid gland, there's not going to be any pain from it. It's going to be painless. The patient may have one thyroid nodule, which means it's a solitary nodule, or they could have many little nodules that they can feel. And it could be hard and fixed. Hard meaning that if you're to actually touch it, it's not soft and squishy. It's hard and it could be fixed meaning that it doesn't move around if you were to try to push it and move it around it doesn't really move around it's fixed in place important point to note with these thyroid nodules is that if there's a sudden onset of pain from the thyroid nodule that is more indicative of a benign thyroid condition so if there is sudden onset of pain in the nodule that increases the chances that that is a benign thyroid condition like a cyst that has hemorrhaged for instance so it could be a thyroid cyst that has had a bleed into it and that can cause pain so that's going to be an important point to note and then there are particular red flags with regards to these thyroid nodules as well one of them is going to be a rapid growth of the thyroid nodule so if the patient sees the lump on their throat and it starts to grow and get larger and if it gets larger rapidly that's a red flag or an ominous sign that this is likely a cancerous growth. The second red flag is that there's a solitary nodule in those above 60 and below 30. So having one nodule in the extremes of age is another red flag. The third red flag with regards to a thyroid nodule is that if the patient is male. And the fourth is that if the nodule itself is nodular. Nodular meaning that 
the lump itself is lumpy and bumpy. It's not a smooth, soft lump. So if you were to actually feel that thyroid nodule, it's not going to be soft and smooth. It's going to be lumpy and bumpy. So that's going to be another red flag for a thyroid nodule as well. Some other signs and symptoms of thyroid cancer include cervical lymph nodes. So there could be cervical lymphadenopathy. There can be swollen, tender lymph nodes in the cervical chain. So there can be swollen, tender lymph nodes in the neck. There could be neck swelling as well. So the neck can get larger and larger, especially in anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. So as that anaplastic cancer grows rapidly, and it does grow rapidly, this is a more serious cancer. That thyroid mass starts to grow rapidly and causes neck swelling. And then as thyroid cancer worsens and that thyroid mass grows, it may start to impinge on other surrounding structures, including the vocal cords and the recurrent laryngeal nerve leading to voice hoarseness. So a patient may have a disrupted voice or lose their voice entirely in some cases. Some other clinical features include dysphagia. So dysphagia is difficulty swallowing. So if the thyroid mass starts to push on the esophagus, so the esophagus is where food passes from the mouth to the stomach, it passes through the esophagus. So if there's something impinging on to the esophagus, there can be difficulty swallowing. Dyspnea, so dyspnea is shortness of breath. This could be due to the thyroid mass that is growing and pushing against the trachea. So that could cause dyspnea as well. We can see this more commonly in anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. Horner syndrome is something else that could occur in thyroid cancer as well. Horner syndrome is a condition involving three signs and symptoms, including meiosis or a excessively constricted pupil, anisocoria, which is different sized pupil. So if you're to look at this patient here, their pupil on their left and right side is different sizes. So that's an isochoria. And then ptosis, which is a drooping eyelid. So those are three signs of Horner syndrome. And Horner syndrome can be caused by a variety of things that essentially compress the sympathetic chain. So that is going to be important and may occur in some later stages of thyroid cancer. And then thyroid cancer can also have constitutional symptoms as well, including weight loss. So there can be significant unintended weight loss, fatigue. So patients can be very, very tired and patients may also have fever and night sweats as well. Let's talk about how thyroid cancer is diagnosed. So it's important to do a head and neck examination. We talked about thyroid nodules being something that is going to be an important sign of thyroid cancer. Some other ways of examining the patient can include indirect laryngoscopy. Some blood work can be also important when assessing if a patient may have thyroid cancer or not. So some blood work, including looking at thyroid hormones, so TSH, T3, T4. We can also look at calcitonin as well. If the patient comes back as hyperthyroid, so they have a low TSH and their T3 and T4 are elevated, this actually is a sign that it is less likely that that thyroid nodule is a malignancy. It could actually be an active nodule, so it could be a toxic adenoma, for instance. And if a clinician were to look at calcitonin levels, there's going to be high calcitonin levels in patients who have medullary thyroid carcinoma. This is, again, a cancer involving C cells, and C cells make calcitonin. So we're going to see high levels of calcitonin in medullary thyroid carcinoma. What's going to be important with diagnosing a thyroid cancer is a fine needle aspiration biopsy of the nodule. And then in some cases, a lobectomy, so taking one of the lobes of the thyroid can be important in making the diagnosis as well. And then in some cases, there can be genetic analyses that are performed. If there is a question of whether or not a patient has medullary thyroid carcinoma, looking at the RET mutation or looking for the RET mutation can be important, especially if that patient has a family history, some of those other conditions we talked about before, those MENTU A and MENTU B conditions, that's going to be important in looking out for the RET mutation. And in some cases and in some locations, if there's a question of whether or not this patient has papillary carcinoma, looking for a BRAF V600E mutation can be something that could be performed as well. Imaging is also going to be very important. So doing a thyroid ultrasonography is going to be important, especially when doing the fine needle aspiration biopsy of the nodule. And then a neck abdominal pelvic CT or MRI is going to be important when looking for metastases or mass extension. So some important areas, and we are not going to talk about this in too much detail, but some of the areas where metastasis can occur include the cervical lymph nodes. So this can be something that can be noted in medullary thyroid carcinoma. And this can actually be found in about 50% of cases on diagnosis. And then with anaplastic carcinoma, we can see metastases in the lungs, bones, and brain. And there can be other mass extension and metastases in 
other types of thyroid carcinoma, including the papillary and follicular types that we talked about before. When thyroid cancer has been diagnosed, it gets staged. And how does it get staged? There's a lot of complexity with cancer staging in general. The staging we're going to look at here for thyroid cancer comes from the American Joint Committee on Cancer, or AJCC. And it's going to be utilizing the tumor node metastasis or TMN classification. So the following is going to be applicable to papillary, follicular, and anaplastic. Medullary thyroid carcinoma uses slightly different staging. So we're not going to talk about that here. But for those other three types, papillary, follicular, and anaplastic, we look at the T or the tumor. So T0 be no primary tumor found. T1 tumor less than or equal to two centimeters and limited to the thyroid, it can be split up into 1A and 1B. We're not going to get into all the details here. T2 is going to be a tumor of two to four centimeters in size and again, limited to the thyroid. T3 is going to be a tumor greater than four centimeters, limited to the thyroid or only involving strap muscles. So strap muscles are infrahyoid muscles in the neck. And then T3 is separated into 3A and 3B. And then T4 is any size tumor with extra thyroidal extension beyond the strap muscles. So once it spreads out further past the infrahyoid muscles, we get into T4 and then T4 is split into 4A and 4B. And you can read these for more information. And then we look at the N or the node as part of our classification. So N0 would be no regional lymph node involvement and N1 would be regional lymph node involvement. And then we look at the M as part of our tumor node metastasis classification. So M0 would be no distant metastases found and M1 would be distant metastases found. So all of these definitions are going to be important when we stage the cancer. And the stages are the following. Stage one is going to be T1 or T2 with N0 and M0. Stage two is going to be T1 to T2 with N1. So there's going to be regional lymph node involvement and M0 or T3A and T3B with any N. So if the patient has T3A or T3B and they may still have N0, then they would still be classified as stage two. Stage three is going to be T4A, any N, and M0. Stage 4A, so stage four gets split into 4A and 4B. Stage 4A is going to be T4B, any N, and M0. And stage 4B is going to be any T with any N and M1. So when a patient gets to distant metastases stage, they already have stage 4B. And then anaplastic carcinoma is going to be slightly different. It's always going to be stage 4. So as soon as a patient has anaplastic carcinoma, they are automatically considered to have stage 4 carcinoma. And they have slightly different staging for anaplastic carcinoma. 4A is going to be T1 to T3A, N0, M0. 4B is going to be T1 to T4, any N and M0. And Stage 4C is going to be T1 to T4, any N, and M1. So again, a brief look at staging. If you want more information, please look up other sources on thyroid cancer staging. Let's talk about the treatment for thyroid cancer. So treatments are going to depend on the type of thyroid cancer we're looking at. So we're first going to look at papillary and follicular types of thyroid cancer and how they are treated. So surgical excision is going to be important for all types of thyroid cancer. And it could be subtotal, so removing a lot of the thyroid, but not all of it, or it could be a total thyrectomy, so removing all of the thyroid gland. And again, surgical excision is an important treatment modality for treating all types of thyroid cancer. But what I do want to mention is that there can be complications of surgery, including recurrent laryngeal nerve injury and hypoparathyroidism. So recurrent laryngeal nerve injury is located in the neck as well. And if there's any damage to this nerve, there can be issues with talking. The patient may have issues with their voice. And then hypoparathyroidism may also occur as well. This is because there are four parathyroid glands that are located on the posterior of the thyroid gland. So when removing the thyroid gland, some of the parathyroid tissue may be removed as well, and this can cause hypoparathyroidism. It's important to have a very experienced surgeon that does thyroid surgeries a lot, so they will have less risk of some of these complications occurring. In some cases, radioiodine ablation may be used as well. So this can help to facilitate the extra treatment of papillary and follicular cancer. And thyroid hormone suppression therapy may be also used as well in these particular types of thyroid cancer. 
in the subtype we talked about before in the follicular category, the herthal or hurdle cell carcinoma, in that particular subtype, a lobectomy, isthmectomy, and a complete thyroidectomy may be used in that particular case. And then if there is cases of papillary and follicular thyroid carcinoma that are refractory or they're advanced, they're not responding to treatments, chemotherapy and radiation therapy may be used in those particular instances. With regards to medullary thyroid carcinoma, a total thyroidectomy with lymphatic dissection of the anterior compartment of the neck is going to be an important treatment for this particular type of cancer. So like we said before, surgery is going to be an important treatment modality for thyroid cancer. But in the case of medullary thyroid carcinoma, a lymphatic dissection of the anterior compartment of the neck is going to be an important next step along with the surgery as well. In some cases, there can be prophylactic central lymph node dissection, and there may also be prophylactic thyroidectomy in cases if the patient has those MEN2A or MEN2B conditions that we talked about before, and then other blood work looking for those MEN-related conditions like pheochromocytoma, for instance, can be important as well. In some cases, systemic chemotherapy, kinase inhibitors, so targeting the RET mutation, may be used in refractory cases. And then once the medullary thyroid carcinoma has been treated, calcitonin follow-up measurements are going to be important. Again, calcitonin is produced by those C-cells. If there's a cancer of those C-cells, we're going to see increased levels of calcitonin. So there may be a case where the patient has their medullary thyroid carcinoma treated, their calcitonin levels start to decrease, but then over time with follow-up measurements, calcitonin starts to increase again. That could be a sign of a recurrence of the cancer. And then in some cases, some clinicians may use carcinoembryonic antigen levels or CEA levels. This can also be helpful in following up on medullary thyroid carcinoma as well. And then for anaplastic thyroid carcinoma, a total or subtotal thyroidectomy can be performed if permitted. So if there is a possibility of helping to reduce that thyroid mass, that can be helpful, especially if there's any impinging or compression symptoms. So like we said before, anaplastic is going to be a very rapidly growing aggressive cancer, and it can start to impinge and compress other surrounding structures, including the esophagus and the airways like the trachea. So this is going to be important in helping reduce some of those symptoms. A tracheotomy may also be required in cases of airway collapse as well. And BRAF kinase inhibitors can be utilized in anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. We didn't mention this before, but a BRAF mutation can also occur in anaplastic thyroid carcinoma and it can worsen the progression of the cancer. So this can also be something that can be utilized in some cases of anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. Targeted radiation and chemotherapy can also be used post-surgery. So after surgery has been performed, targeted radiation and chemotherapy can also be used as well. So if you want to learn more about other types of cancer, please check out my lessons on those topics. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.